Welcome. Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. My name is Jessica Thomas. I am the managing director of the Center for Sustainable Enterprise here at UNC's Keenan Flagler Business School. Um, we are delighted to uh, have two visionary leaders in the green building space um, out tonight to speak, and we are very happy to co-host this event with the North Carolina Triangle Chapter of the U.S. Green Building Council. Um, it's wonderful to see uh, people so excited about this event. I mean, as we think back on, we're, we're celebrating our 10-year anniversary for the Center for Sustainable Enterprise this year, um, and it's just, um, it's really exciting to think about 10 years of how we've been working to really uh, provide educational research and outreach opportunities in the field of sustainable enterprise. So thank you all very much for coming out and participating in this event. Um, I would like to start out by introducing our moderator this evening. So uh, Gordon Merk Merkline will be moderating tonight's event. He is the Executive Director of Real Estate Development here at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, Gordon has had, uh, I think, at least two decades of experience in real estate development um, with a strong focus on sustainability. Uh, he sits on a number of local boards and is very active uh, both uh, during his work hours and outside of work hours in sustainable development in Chapel Hill and the, the greater uh, community. So we're very happy to have Gordon moderating our conversation today um, and really hoping for a very engaging discussion between Gordon uh, Rob Watson and Dennis Quainton. So I'll invite Gordon to come up and uh, kick things off for us. But uh, thank you once again for joining us this evening. Thanks, everyone. I uh, appreciate you showing up, uh, especially at a five o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Um, I recognize there are drinks afterwards, so there may be some people here for that. But you've got to sit through a sustainability presentation first. I want to take a brief minute to introduce um, our keynote speaker, Rob Watson. Rob is best known as the founding father of LEAD and has, uh, served on its national steer has served as its National Steering Committee Chairman between 1994 and 2005. And during that time, as many of you are aware, it became uh, the most widespread and fastest growing standard by which all green buildings are measured, not only here in the United States, but, but quickly around the world. Um, in 2006, Rob set out on his own and formed Ecotech International to meet the needs of clients and their green building needs and measurement requirements, uh, not only here in the United States, but extensively uh, in China and India as well. Uh, prior, to, prior to all of uh, the Green Building Council, and actually, I guess, it, for a large part of his time on that as well, since a lot of it was voluntary, from 85 to 2006, he was a senior scientist and director at the National Resources Defense Council, uh, part of their international energy and green building programs. And Rob has also served as the director at US, <coughs> excuse me, US GBC uh, since 2005, 2005, as well as from 1995 to 2002, and served as its vice chairman uh, from 1999 to 2000. Rob has degrees from both um, Dartmouth as well as Cal Berkeley. And like many in the audience, he has uh, successfully completed, or many are about to complete, his MBA from Columbia University. Dennis Quaintance, um, I love his, and, and one of the first things I found out about Dennis is that he began his career in hospitality at the age of 15. And so he's got about four or five years experience, um, as, you, as you'll notice. He started out as a housekeeper assistant uh, at a hotel in Missoula, Montana. Uh, so he has certainly paid his dues and seen every part of the business, which is probably what has made him successful today because he's experienced all aspects of the hotel industry. He's, uh, I think, where they really put their name on the map in Greensboro was the opening uh, with he and his partner, uh, which also includes his wife, uh, two very successful restaurants as well as the, um, as, as well as the Four Diamond o o Henry Hotel. And if many of y'all aren't familiar with it by now, you'll certainly hear about it today. But the Proximity Hotel um, was the first um, gold, platinum? platinum, platinum hotel in the United States. And it is an example um, that, it, that is held up by many and has served, has people come out to seek uh, Rob's, I mean, Dennis's experience of, of what they've done that and to stay at the hotel. It is very well known. Uh, Within the, within the green industry. 
So with that, I'd like to turn this over for a, a presentation first um, by Rob, and then we will have some, um, a, dis a brief discussion, and then we will open it up to the audience for Q&A afterwards. Rob? Let's see, I'm going to need to transition this. Okay, so I uh, really appreciate you all coming out tonight. Uh, as Gordon said, um, I don't know whether it's uh, your interest in the topic, uh, draw me of the, as a speaker, or your, the sad state of your social life, but um, I'm very glad to have you all here. Um, normally, as a person who focuses on sustainability, I really try and uh, understand what's going on locally and, and sort of adopt uh, you know, local um, practices, et cetera, and I know that the speaking cadences in the South are a little bit slower than where I'm from, New York City. Um, sadly, I'm going to violate this convention and go blazingly fast because there's a ton of stuff to cover and we don't have that much time and, and actually um, I think it would be much more interesting to have a conversation with Dennis and Gordon afterwards. So um, I will be tripping over my tongue uh, frequently during this conversation because uh, in 20 minutes I'm going to be trying to map out uh, where I see kind of the future going and what kind of confidence and what kind of uh, thought patterns we need today. And clearly uh, that violates Miss Piggy's third law, which is never eat more than you can lift. And um, uh, so, uh, um, you know, when I, was a, when I was a child, I was actually uh, very drawn to the Pogo cartoon. I don't know if this is familiar to uh, folks. This was uh, very popular in the 60s, and Walt Kelly was a, a very uh, intelligent person. And in 1971, he, he did this um, cartoon, and, and I sort of look back on this as sort of the halcyon days of, of environmentalism, where, you know, the things that we were really worried about were litter and, you know, crying Indians and things like that. Um, but I think if we uh, look at how he defines the environmental problem, I think he really hit the nail on the head that really we are um, our own worst enemy. But at the same time, in this movie of how this, uh, this, this human species uh, and life on this planet is gonna, um, gonna play out, we are also, you know, the, we're, we're, we are uh, the enemy, but also uh, what I hope to convey, also the hero. And so I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the first piece of this, you know, what are we doing uh, to uh, this gem in, in space and, and um, how can we uh, then, then eventually get out of it. So if we compare and contrast the red and green bars uh, compared to the blue bars, um, we can see that you know, most of the land areas uh, that um, are attached to human activity um, are in a very um, significant state of distress. Uh, the, um, I think the modern day uh, canary in the coal mine uh, with regards to uh, species and, and how um, things are going uh, at, uh, on the level of the biosphere, uh, it's, it's no longer the uh, canary in the coal mine, it's, it's the frog in the pond. Um, and we can see that you know, uh, amphibians uh, are, are obviously in great distresses as well as mammals. You know, and um, they don't include uh, the plant species, which uh, in rainforest and other um, uh, types of, of ecosystems are, are under uh, even greater uh, distress. And so, um, you know, moving on to water, uh, you know, there has been no new water created on this planet for about four and a half billion years. So it is, you know, the most precious of all the resources that we as humans use uh, regularly, and yet we treat it with so much respect that we flush toilets in the desert with drinking water. And so uh, if we look at how scarce this actually is, of the fresh water, uh, approximately 0.3% of that 3%, 0.3% of the 3% of the fresh water on the planet is uh, on surface water, which is pretty much mostly what we use. We use some groundwater. Uh, and of that surface water, uh, only 2%, 2 percent of 0.3 percent of 3 percent. This is a very small number. That's where we get about 80 percent of the water we use. Now, about half of the accessible groundwater and about half of the rivers are too polluted to treat in, 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 in ways that are economic. So another way of looking at it is that of all the water on Earth, you know, using current, um, you know, again, anything resembling uh, cost effectiveness, 99% uh, of that water is unusable, and of the usable portion, 
uh, a very vanishingly small piece of that is accessible to us. And so uh, we've got to do something a little bit different. Okay, a quick uh, quiz. Okay, of the three categories, transport building, industry, uh, green, anybody care to hazard a guess what that is in, in the United States? Which, which, which portion is, is green? Buildings. Buildings, okay, wrong. Transport, okay. Yellow. Industry. industry. Very good, okay, and the rest has to do with buildings or, you know, the building materials, you know, is classified under um, uh, industry, but if we weren't building buildings, we wouldn't be uh, using that. And so, you know, as we uh, look at business as usual um, uh, scenarios going forward, uh, it looks like uh, energy growth in the next 20 years or so is going to grow by 50%. Okay, and so we're taking a situation where we're already fairly cognizant and, and have a high state of agreement is completely unsustainable and we're gonna make it worse by 50%. Um, and you know, not to be accusatory or anything like that, but you know, 50%, almost 50% of that growth is concentrated in two countries, which is uh, China and India, which comprises uh, close to 40% of the world's population um, and has been uh, you, you know, but, but only uses, uh, you know, between 10% um, uh, uh, to 20% on a per capita basis, the energy consumption that we use uh, in this country. And of course, the energy use we're doing today uh, has added a very significant amount of CO2 to the atmosphere. Um, and, you know, most people believe that sort of the climate ideal, if you will, uh, for continued um, survival of the mix of species and everything that we have here is about 350 parts per million. <clears throat> and so the best hope of the Kyoto process and everything is trying to stabilize at 450. Um, at 380, 390, we're already beginning to see weird weather. You know, I've heard the term global weirding, which is, I think is a pretty interesting uh, term to explain um, what's going on. Now, any one of these issues, you know, land, species, water, uh, carbon by itself would be, you know, difficult and tragic for us as, as humans. Um, and yet the, the combination, I think, um, really means that, uh, you know, we are in a pretty serious uh, situation. And I, I think, uh, you know, the analogy to the Titanic is, is pretty apt. Um, I'll call uh, the, the situation, you know, the SS business as usual. And in my opinion, uh, and this is after looking at it uh, for 50 year, uh, 25 years, um, that, you know, business as usual has hit the iceberg, okay? That we have started processes and things in motion that we cannot stop. Uh, and that, um, you know, our life as we know it, possibly not in our lifetime, but certainly in something that would be considered modern forecastable memory uh, is largely over. Now, we are reacting predictably as many people did after the Titanic hit the iceberg, okay? A lot of people, ref not only did a lot of people not even know that something got hit, but many of the passengers could not believe that this unsinkable ship was in fact shifting, is sinking. And so here we are, we've got business as usual, and there's this little rinky-dink sustainability lifeboat sitting out in the middle of a freezing dark ocean. Now who in their right mind would get into that little boat when the big business as usual unsinkable ship is still there, okay? And all the experts uh, were similarly unconcerned. You know, they looked at the problem, and they said, yeah, I think we ought to go make some coffee. And so, you know, we all know what happened. By the time we figured out what the hell was going on, it was too late, right? You jump out of an airplane, it's easy to pretend you're flying for five and a half miles, okay? And you know, the thing is, is that it's not the fall that kills you, right? 
It's that sudden stop at the end. Okay. So, you know what? Uh, you know what are we? You know, there's. I sort of do a thing. Okay, how many people want to save the world, save the planet? Okay, good. All right. So you can all leave. Okay. There's. We don't really have anything to talk about because, um, in fact, it's not about the planet. Okay. It's about us. And let me, let me clarify that, okay? First of all, um, if you look at what the planet's been through, okay, it's four and a half billion years. We stretched our arms from end to end and took a nail file. Human history gone. Who misses a nail file? Stroke, okay? Uh, the chances of us being human, in other words, we have threaded all of these extinctions, okay? By definition, if whatever our star stuff is had not threaded that needle, we as a species would not be here, okay? Uh, about two-tenths of 1% of everything that's ever existed ever is still around in some form or another. That's, the, you know, that's a guess. Um, and uh, so the you know, the planet, you know, the worst we could be, you know, even if we left it a total nuclear wasteland toxic mess, okay, uh, is that any worse than super volcanoes like, you know, Yellowstone Park is a giant volcano and someday it's going to go boom. Um, we've had asteroids that, you know, I mean, we saw what happened when that comet hit Jupiter, right? I mean, that would have basically ended all life on this planet. Um, and yet, you know, and all that's happened here, and yet somehow, we look out and there is this absolute profusion of life, okay? And that's what the planet is geared toward. That's the business of the planet, with generating life. So the question is, we leave by a warm, stinking, toxic mess. Well, what's gonna happen? Well, the vast amounts of solar energy and all the chemical, physical, and biological processes that go on every day are gonna keep going on and something else is gonna happen and we're just not gonna be part of it. Um, so, you know, uh, yeah, so now we're all depressed. I should, we should bring the wine in. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we got into this, and, um, and, and so how do we get out of it? All right, I'm gonna reach into my wallet for the answer, okay? All right, I have in this hand a $1 bill, and in this hand a $20 bill. All right, um, I will give this to anybody who can give me two objective physical reasons why this is worth 20 times this. Physical objective reasons why this is worth 20 times, this rectangle, this green rectangle, why that is worth 20 times this green rectangle. Anybody? Okay, physical objective reason. It's what, what's physical about, what's objective? What's physical about that? What's objective? Okay, it's, so we have a negotiation that's based on an understanding that's based on a concept and a thought. Give me something physical. Okay, physical. Okay, well, uh, okay, all right. So do you think, is that, is that worth 20 times the value? Again, is that an objective physical reason why it's 20, worth 25? It's, it's a difference, it's a physical difference. I'll give you that. Okay, I'll, I'll give you, okay, let's, let, me, let me transmute this. I'll say this is a $100 bill and this is, they both have plastic strips. Give me a, a physical objective reason why this is worth five times this. What do you mean resource? Okay, no, no, you're absolutely right. It does represent money, but why does this paper that has, okay, why does one of these things buy me 20 times more stuff than the other? Exactly. That's right. There's nothing physical or objective about it. What it is, is an idea, okay? So the idea is about a paradigm. It's a way of thinking 
This is a concept. This is solar. 20, it's, I'm exaggerating a little bit for the purpose of the illustration. This is solar, this is coal. There's absolutely nothing physical or objective about one being cheaper than the other. It's just the way we have thought up to this point, and we have a construct uh, that I would argue is no longer uh, viable. We, I call this concept the 18th century belief system that I call egonomics, Adam Smith, okay? What we need is a 21st century paradigm, a 21st century way of looking at things that I call, you know, economics, right? If we actually look at the root of the word, maybe we can actually, if we actually did something about it, we might actually be able uh, to survive. So again, pick the inexpensive resource. We've got something that's finite, non-renewable, remote, inequitably distributed, dangerous to extract, very toxic, and overall less than 30% efficient. Okay, we've got something that's unlimited, on-site, mostly everywhere, no danger of extraction, mostly benign, and 20% efficient and growing. Objectively, physically, which one should be more expensive? And what the hell is wrong with us that we have to cost justify our existence as a species? Now, uh, back you know, way back when, times that we like to uh, laugh at, and there we go. Uh, people used to think that the Earth was at the center of the universe. It was a way of thinking, it was an idea, it was shared. It was fact for all intents and purposes. And then a young man presented an inconvenient truth that things that were physical and seen were not explainable with this model. So what did uh, the Church of Egonomics do? It branded him a heretic and basically, um, you know, uh, tried to do things like uh, Tycho Brahe. I don't know how well you can see this, but we got the Earth and the Moon in the center, and then we got the Sun revolving around, and Venus and Mercury and Mars, and, and this is a simplified thing because the, you know, Saturn, Uranus, and everything like that do little dipsy doodles inside those orbits. Okay, now this is my, uh, this is the uh, 15, 14th, 16th century version of uh, cap and trade, uh, externality adders. Adam Smith is structurally, paradigmatically incapable. We are not ever going to be able to cost justify at the scale, scope, and speed what we need to do using this 18th century paradigm because at its core, structurally, fundamentally, intrinsically, is the separation of the impact of the transaction from the transaction itself. And you didn't need that back then. I'm not saying Adam Smith was an evil guy. You know, he was using, you know, he was explaining human behavior. He was giving a framework for interaction. Um, and the environment was not, you know, environment, social equity, uh, you know, the impacts of these transactions that, that go at things that we all now come to believe are a lot more important. It just wasn't part of the way of thinking, okay? Um, and so, but we got to get real about the business of the planet, okay? The business of the planet is creating life, okay? And the currency and the performance metrics are chemistry, biology, and physics. And if we had to uh, do the celebrity smackdown between chemistry, biology, and physics, and economics, politics, and habit, uh, you know, who do you think is going to win? Okay? I mean, it's just, it's, it's obvious. And, and so, you know, here we are, we're this magnificent species. We've got the ability to, you know, forecast. We've got the ability to contemplate our place in the universe. And we've, we've got the ability to create music and art and, and all these things that nothing else can do. And what do we do with it? We focus on our quarterly uh, earning statement, all right? So, you know, at the end of the day, are we going to be the, the test case dummy, you know, and we're going to be sitting there uh, on the cosmic plane and we're going to be asked, you know, let me get this straight. You say you had no steering and no brakes and the car just ran into the wall on its own. And so, you know, we are in effect committing essentially a species suicide um, and acting like a bunch of uh, test, uh, you know, car test dummies. And, you know, how do we get out of this? Well, we've got this dilemma that, you know, when a, when we sort of talk about incremental changes, oh, you're a visionary, you're great, oh boy, you know, all these little 
tweaks, all the so-called clean tech, all that stuff, you know, that's all great. Um, and you try to propose something radical like changing something that is basically uh, slowly killing us, like economics, uh, as is currently practiced. Don't get me wrong, I think people should be fabulously wealthy. You know, the sun provides 2,000 times more energy than we need. How on earth can we not create wealth with that? But we need a paradigm that doesn't restrict money from going into these gigantic flows and, and, and opportunities for wealth as opposed to focusing them on things that are, un, are limited, finite, renewable, toxic, et cetera. So the question is, do we have the radical confidence to abandon SS business as usual because the alternative is abandoning spaceship Earth? We all know that's not an option. Now, you know, we are going into a little small lifeboat. Uh, waters are not completely uncharted. Uh, we have some, you know, within the constraints of economics, uh, California basically uses uh, now about half the energy on a per capita basis, uh, and that has been a conscious decision between uh, the, uh, the interaction between market pull and regulatory push. Uh, if the market pull had not been there, uh, politically, it would not have been able, you would not have been able to do more than half of the uh, standards. So it is conscious, you've got to pick it. Um, ACEEE, and, and in fact, there's a great deal of synergy because when, when you've got the, um, when you've got the uh, market pull that's developing the, the market for the next uh, thing, you can go farther on building standards, which sets up the next uh, leap. So there is synergy there. Um, ACEEE yesterday just released a study for North Carolina found that uh, contrary to uh, you know, uh, common uh, perspective, a, a lot of net new jobs uh, can be created, a lot of net cumulative economic savings can happen, and a lot of them happen from pretty basic things that are well established all over, energy efficiency standards, uh, livable community design, uh, innovation, you know, which is the kind of thing that university, uh, universities can play a huge uh, role. So you know, we have business as usual, and how do we clean it up? Well, let's make it pretty, uh, let's make it interesting, let's put things where they belong, like cars in back, not in front, um, and little, bring a little bit nature in. So would you rather live here? What, what, what do you think is more expensive? What do you think is better, this or this? Okay, so let, I mean, let's get serious here. This is you know, not, it's not rocket science. I mean, even uh, as, as progressive an institute, uh, institution as um, uh, the World uh, Energy um, Forum uh, has a technically feasible scenario for getting to a 450, and, and we all, you know, everybody says 450 like it's good. Um, you know, 450 just means it's not unmanageable. So we only get a Katrina every few years instead of like every month, okay? Um, and that's what unmanageable climate change means. It's like you are holding on for dear life and just hoping that the social fabric doesn't dissolve around you. But we've got carbon capture and storage. You know, we've got nuclear power. You know, and you can argue about whether that's you know a, a, a cost opportunity or whatever. Um, it's not where I would put my money initially. Certainly, um, you know, I love fusion. You know, sun, safe distance, two thousand times more than you need. Blah blah blah. Um, Biofuels renewable. All all this stuff again. These are off. These are state of the shelf technology. We've known what to do, frankly, ever since Jimmy Carter. Um, it's not rocket science. And you know, we've got countries stepping up, you know, like China and has uh, agreed um, to, uh, you know, step up and try and reduce the growth. Again, reduce the growth. It's still growing. Problem. We gotta, gotta do something where you make money by stopping the growth, and we are not there yet. Uh, technology penetration rates have, have grown significantly. Again, information can change. Uh, we can cycle uh, new technologies in faster. These are very positive signs. We've seen lead that has grown absolutely phenomenal. If something like lead can grow as rapidly as it has, which is disruptive on every single level of a very conservative, and if you'll pardon the pun, concrete operative industry, there is absolutely, we absolutely have the tools uh, to uh, change things. And so a lot of people in the face of these, um, you know, huge problems say, well, what, you know, what, what difference does it make? Well, it makes a huge difference. And look, if you didn't do it, then it didn't happen. If it didn't happen, if nobody did it, then nothing would happen. So it's really like, like Gandhi said, you've got to do it even though it doesn't seem uh, very important. I mean, you know, we're uh, you know, a minor planet in a minor star in a minor galaxy in a minor cluster, okay? So if all life is extinguished on this planet, the universe won't give a damn, okay? But it's really important to us. And I think we owe it to ourselves to this fantastic 
creation called the human species for us all to, you know, what does the hero do in the face of insurmountable odds? It does the right thing. We need heroic action right now. It's the only thing that's going to save us. So in the movie of this sinking ship, are we the guys cowering, uh, you know, in the upside down ballroom waiting for help to come or are we the people that are climbing through the pipes and risking everything to get the hell out of there because we know that where we are is going down so if we can figure out a way for green to be the most profitable and it's not able to be that yet at the scale scope and speed we need but all we have to do is change the way we think it can happen all right so uh, if you are interested in ramblings that uh, I do every week um, and uh, are just you know, provoked, incensed, outraged, whatever, by this, uh, send me your ideas. Uh, and now we're getting to the interesting part where Dennis and I are going to sit down with Gordon and, and, and have a, a, a conversation. So thank you. Uh, several of us had a chance to have dinner with Rob last night, and he, he gave us a, 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 a little bit of a, a preview and a taste, so um, I was able to grab a glass of wine and drink some uh, Prozac this morning, uh, so I'm kind of numb. But in all seriousness, Rob, you, you, your discussion on the environment, and then as we were discussing last night, uh, we've got worldwide debt levels that are obviously growing and... and, and about to collide. We in the U.S. we have all these unfunded mandates from Social Security, Medicare, all these pension funds. All these ultimately are interrelated because I think, as you mentioned, they they, they deal with something that, that we've created and things that we've done. Um, you mentioned heroic measures. What are some examples of heroic measures that we need to take? And since we're in, in a business school, you know, what kind of context of a business? Um, can we think about in yeah. terms of, of making heroic measures? Well, I mean, the first thing we need to do when we, when we do our analysis, we got to get rid of the time value of money. I mean, the idea that, uh, you know, all costs and benefits go to zero within 10 years is, you know, that's just, that, that completely defies the physical reality of the business of the planet. And again, our survival as a species is not, is not dependent on human law. It's dependent on natural law. The difference is that natural law applies to all species, not just us. We are at the top of the pyramid, nothing cares about us if we get lopped off. So if we want to continue in our you know, exalted opinion, we you know, got to get serious. We got to stop pretending that you know, uh, our, our future needs to be cost justified somehow, that um, you know, human well-being uh, is, um, you know, that, that you know, it's more profitable to fix a problem than to prevent it. You know things like that, and so it's just it's going to be it's 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 changing the way we think, and you know the, my huge frustration right now is, I I don't know what the mechanics look like yet, right? I've got an idea, I'm not happy with the way things are, but I have no idea how to get from point A to point B, and so right now I got nothing, and it's it's frustrating as hell. So I'm hoping by talking about it, people can bounce off, you know, challenge, figure out how do we get from, you know, point A to point B. You know, I mean, it's, you know, all we need is world peace. Well, yeah, it's all well and good, but that in 250 will get you Starbucks, so. Um. Well, Dennis, I, I'm curious from your part, I mean, people look at now, and, and I think a lot of what people think you, you've done within your industry is certainly heroic. Um, it's, a, it's a step forward. I'm, I'm curious as to what led you to make that change. Uh, what, you know, I mean, you were a hoteler and a restauranteur. What, what inspired you uh, to, to do what you, what you did? Well, we had twins um, 11 years ago, and uh, we, we've always thought that we were, um, that future generations would look back uh, and say, you know, you jerks, uh, we hate your guts. Um, <laughs> but we didn't have anyone really specific to worry about. <laughs> um, so, but once they came in, we said, oh, you know, now we're going to have to do something. All right. That's pretty much it. Uh, but, and, and so using that, though, I mean, so how did you get the concept of, of you know, the hotel and, 
Um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm curious, sort of, I mean, as, 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 it, as it began to take shape, I mean, did it start out as a little idea and keep growing and growing and growing, or? You know, I, I love sharing this because really what happened was we, th that's really what happened. When our children were born, we said, you know, the way I think about it is that I'm a capitalist. I don't apologize for that. I'm just a subset of the species. And we're, we respond to just a few things. And basically, capitalism has one rule, and that is you uh, have more income than outgo. And if you break that rule, you get ejected from the game. So as a person didn't come along with money and still doesn't have any uh, much, but uh, I thought that as a capitalist, I needed to just play by those rules, and that if I wanted to go out and be an activist, I'd take another career path. So. When, um, when these children came along, we went back and said, listen, we're just a small outfit. We're not GE or something. I mean, we can, we can, uh, we can plug in a sustainable practices initiative. And all we're going to do is we're going to ask, every time we make a decision, we're going to ask basically two things. How might this decision uh, affect the physical world? And what can we do that considers that? And how might it affect the social world? Because if we don't start treating people fairly, we're in a world of doo-doo too. That's just a different day. Um, so we said, you know, we can do this. So we started applying those filters to our decision-making process. So when it came time to build a hotel, we said, well, let's just do that. We, we're the unintentional lead platinum. We had no goals. Our goal uh, relating to, to green, our goal was that we would consider sustainable practices in the physical world but we were sure as hell more interested in our guests being comfortable because it ain't sustainable to go broke. <laughs> um, so we, were, we wouldn't trump guest comfort to save, um, to save energy. But we, this just goes to show, this is a great illustrated example, that this ain't hard. We didn't have an intention. And, and, but, but we did have some structural differences that we intend to own our investments for a long time. I will never do a, any business thing that doesn't have at least 50% equity. And I always want at least a decade of headlights. I want to. I want to assume I'm going to own it a decade from now. Well, physically, you know, Nancy and I's belief is that you live your life like you're going to die next week, and simultaneously like you're going to die 1,000 years from now. Mm -hmm. So consider them both simultaneously. So that's how we did it. Was that too long? No, that's fine. Okay. Rob, how do we how, how do we learn from Dennis? Well, I mean, <laughs> well, no, don't do that. No, no, yeah, I mean, no, no, absolutely, absolutely. Hell yeah, hell yeah. No, no, I think they're absolutely. Well, I think. You know, again, I think the lesson to be learned is what, what Dennis did is he did not succumb to the 90-10 syndrome, right? He didn't spend 90% of his time analyzing 10% of the benefits. He knew there was a benefit in uh, the brand value, the, you know, the ability to differentiate by being green, and not only just being green, but being green at a significant level. A lot of, you know, if you show lead to good designers, they say, that's just good design. Well, yeah, I mean, really, green buildings, I think, is hopefully a term that's on its way out. There should be good buildings and bad buildings. And you know, how can you create a beautiful piece of built art when you're destroying cathedrals of nature? I don't think, you know, I think if you look at, you know, in the totality, that's ugliness. Right. Um, and so, again, just using good engineering and design principles, you can eliminate the at you know, 60 to 70% of waste that is in a typical structure. It's frankly not that hard. Yeah, no, it wasn't. And, and that's a really big point. There's an urban legend. Uh, is it my turn? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so, no, this is a conversation. A there are no turns. Yeah, no, no, we're, we're, we're talking. You've got here. a talking. microphone. It's your turn. We're talking. <laughs> um, exactly. Uh, but, you know, we, we, there, there, it isn't, uh, it wasn't hard. I mean, uh, the, like this hotel is a luxury hotel, the proximity and restaurant, and, uh, and it uses 39.6% less energy than the ASHRAE 90.2 standard, which is the current lead, sta uh, lead benchmark. And you know, if you would ask me in the beginning what we'd accomplish, I'd say 5% maybe. I mean, it's a luxury hotel. What are you going to cut? I had no idea that our standards are, I can say with authority, 40% above a reasonable baseline, because luxury is a reasonable baseline. And so anyway, uh, it isn't, it is, lead is perfect. It gives you enough reward um, that, that if you, you just pay attention to it, you can get somewhere. Um, but it isn't, uh, so, uh, but it isn't uh, uh, 
something that if you, if you, you just don't end up with platinum because you showed up and said, I want it. I mean, you've got to actually do something. So it's just right. I was saying, Rob and I were agreeing last night that, you know, you know it's a good program when, when the, the really staunch environmentalist and the really staunch capitalist are equally displeased by it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but anyway. Yeah. Um, Rob, one thing I'm interested in is, is something that I think that um, egonomics has grabbed onto from the lead perspective and, and the whole um, sustainability perspective is greenwashing. Mm -hmm. How do we break that? I mean, because it's clearly to me, it's a violation of what it's all about to begin with. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, when, when we were first figuring out, I mean, when I went to the a meeting, uh, you know, it was my first meeting at USGBC. They'd been heavily recruiting me from NRDC. And I said, well, what is a green building? I had no idea what a green building, I knew what an energy efficient building was, I knew water efficiency, I knew all these pieces of it, but I didn't know what a green building was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was nervousness that, you know, people were screwing compact fluorescence in, in the, uh, you know, the front uh, porch lights and saying they had a green building. So there was, there was no definition. So, so the first step is obviously defining and proving. Everybody says, oh, busy work, paperwork, I'd rather do the sustainability. And sure, I would rather just read the curriculum of a university online and not have to take tests and not have to be graded and not have to go, you know, spend tens of thousands of dollars a year for a diploma. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, how much credibility, you know, if somebody came into you and said, oh, I, I studied this, I studied that, you know, it's not that they're not smart, but, you know, they're, they're saying they've got a credential, and unless you got a diploma to prove it, then you're just basically blowing smoke. Des, what do you think? I mean, I heard you on, on NPR's The State of Things on Monday of this week, and, and you, you, you talked about that. Um, give us some examples of what you think, and how do we, how do we break that? Break what? Break the greenwashing. Well, we're the empowered folk. You know, you just, if you pay attention, I think that, uh, that most green claims are exaggerations. I wouldn't believe anything, and I don't believe any green claim unless it's third party verified. That's why LEED's so damn smart. So we're, Thomas Friedman says it really well, we're not having a green revolution, we're having a green advertisement, a green party, whatever you want to call it. It's just true, and so, you know, this is a joke. I mean, the green, there's no green revolution. It's a joke. Have you ever and seen a revolution where nobody got killed? Yeah, it's just, it's just crazy. So, so basically, if you see any green claim that isn't supported by a third party verification that's quantifiable, ignore it. Don't be loyal to those, those folks. If you see one that is, be loyal and I'll, uh, you know, have your son and daughter's wedding at our place. Yeah. Um, I'm a, and, I'm and, a, so, and, and how, what's, how do we address it? I mean, well, but I mean, you know, I mean, it, it, look, it's, I mean, you know, look, comp competition is a wonderful thing. Uh, you know, and competition is absolutely brutal, brutal. Um, and so when leaders start calling out the greenwashers, right? So you know, don't be afraid to name names, and we should not be afraid uh, to name names. Um, that if people are greenwashing. Uh, and there are greenwash alert, you know, websites and stuff like that. So, you know, be, you know, there is a little bit of caveat on mTOR still, but, um, you know, hopefully, you know, credible green labels will end up uh, winning out, you know, like FSC over SFI. Um, it's not that SFI has not improved forestry practices, industrial forestry practices. It absolutely has. It's made a big difference. But it's the difference between a label that promotes a forest as an ecosystem and a living being, as opposed to cleaning up the factory floor. Because even in, you know an SFI labeled wood is basically a clean factory. It has 95% less biodiversity than a forest, but it's way better than what they used to do. But I would not say that it earns that market leadership. Uh, it should not get that market leadership award. And I'd like to add, I, I think that it's really important to recognize that, that, that this caveat emptor, I add caveat vertus emptor, beware <laughs> green buyer, because if you're building a building or even remodeling or doing green stuff, a lot of the folks that are selling this, these green amenities, they're not so great. I mean, they're, they're, if, if, if you put in a bamboo floor and it lasts a year and a half, that isn't a good idea. Right. What if you put in a floor that lasts 65 years? Yeah and you build a house where it may still be a house in 400 years, and you build it so it can still be a house. I mean, there's a lot to consider. One of the problems I have with where we are is that we don't have the vocabulary, literally as the, the rich billion people on the uh, earth. We don't, have, uh, we, don't, we don't have the model. We self-load 
um, uh, filtering mechanisms when we make most of our decisions. Like when we make a decision about buying something, we self-load a budget decision. We don't even have a frame of reference for where the filter is for a sustainability decision. We hadn't as a species passed it on to the next generations. So we're the ones that have to pick up and figure out how to insert, like we taught people when we monetize pieces of paper. Well, now we need to start considering these sorts of things in a, in a, in a way that becomes rote. And, and, and we're and so far away from it. If you think you're green, yeah, no, let me make yeah, fun of you. If every, if I don't every think building I'm green. were platinum, yeah. we would still continue our slide into the abyss. Um, and, yeah. and, and so, you know, and, and part of the difficulty is that, you know, we are in a simultaneous differential equation. And as population grows, that's a huge wild card. We've got development going on. And we don't know where that sustainable condition is yet. Anybody who says they do, does is just blowing smoke. Yeah, I, I agree. I, what I argue about our hotel is please don't be impressed by it. Only be impressed comparatively. Right, right. Uh, but, but all the, 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 the proximity hotel is with, with the, what we accomplished uh, is going in the wrong direction slower. And look, I, I mean, I agree with, with Bill McDonough who says, you know, you know, if, if, you're, uh, if your point is to go to Canada, uh, you know, there's no point in going slower towards Mexico. Um, by the same token, anybody in a car heading towards Mexico at 100 miles an hour that wants to do a U-turn, I will kill them uh, before, you know, and then hit the brakes. Uh, we've got to slow down before we make that U-turn, but we've got to make the U-turn, and we've got to, you know, we, I mean, it's hard enough to contemplate even lead platinum for a lot of people, let alone what we really need to do. I mean, we're just not ready to hear it, and, and we are and in that Gandhi's heretic par uh, parado paradox. And, and that's why I think that this, uh, this, this notion of lead and the way that it's set up is so smart, because if you look at it, we, we cannot just be idealistic and affect change. You're just a fruitcake. Um, but no, I'm 100% nothing is nothing. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and on the other side, if you, all you are is just pragmatic and you just sort of get along in the current concept, then you're not very damn interesting. So what I say is let's all be I, uh, practical idealists. And this is something we've been saying a long time, and it's interesting. Rob's talking about it. So finally, I Googled it. And guess who said it? Gandhi. He's the one that coined that phrase. So he's my boy. So one last question. <laughs> How, you, you, both of y'all talk about we move, you know, that, that, that uh, we're moving, you know, slow, but we're still not going in the right directions. I mean, how do you do what you're doing and what you're doing and get us, how do we accelerate to where we need to be? I mean, what, what are the drastic steps that we need to be other than the fact that I think we all screwed up and we didn't go get our degrees in biology, chemistry, and physics? <laughs> right. Well, again, it's just, uh, look, humans are, you know, even though we've got foresight and consciousness, and we are still short-sighted, selfish creatures, okay? And there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. Why don't we just create an incentive system that makes us get everything we want by doing something that benefits everybody? I mean, it's, it's just the way we think. It, it just, so go out, do the right thing, and get millions of dollars. How wonderful would that be? I mean, and, and that would solve all our problems. We would no longer, there would no longer be a discussion. It's like, oh, why don't we cover the whole thing with, with photo photovoltaics and do, you know, 10 meter thick glass walls and, you know, what, I mean, every, all of that conversation would go away. The right thing to do, the better thing to do would be the profitable thing, and then there's no discussion. We are harnessing our natural proclivity towards short-term, you know, towards selfish short-term thinking, that actually we would we transmute that to the benefit of the whole planet. And that's, we've got, but we've got to have a system of thinking that pulls that. You know, well, and, and right on. And uh, first of all, if I were the czar for sustainability, I have a sign in my office that said it's about the density stupid. Uh, I think we push up density. Um, uh, and, and to a reasonable level, you don't want Cabrini Green sort of density. You, you, it, it's engineered Oregon experiment sort of uh, studies around proxemics make sense. Second, our brother Thomas Berry that just died, you know, with the old Ecozoic uh, era thing. What if we really just changed our damn minds? What if we decide that, that we loved everyone else that was on this planet now? And we also love people that ain't here yet mm -hmm. for maybe 10, 20 generations, maybe 100 generations. What if that was the common paradigm? What if the Pope and the Dalai Lama, well, the Dalai Lama already says it, but anyway. Um, <laughs> but what, what, if, what if Pope got up and started saying, that's all we're doing? 
we're going to love each other. And let's make that our paradigm each day. It doesn't mean you run around and pay patty cake, patty cake. If you got a dishwasher comes in late, you, you fire their ass, you know? I mean, you know, you know, it, 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 you know but, but what if that were really where we were coming from? What if we said that we choose to experience ourselves as being loving and lovable and competent? And that was the paradigm. It wasn't any more simple or any more complex than that. And what if we really were sincere about considering future generations? What if we had a chair at each meeting and we said, okay, we'd like to hear from you now. And that was a person from 100 generations out. And what if we gave them a voice? We have the, uh, the ability for abstract thought. We can go sit in that chair and channel those suckers. It's easy. Yeah. But right. we don't do it. Yeah. I mean, Joe Van Bellingham was a developer, did Dockside in Vancouver, said, seek not to be loved, but to love. Right. Right? So I, we could obviously keep going for, for, <laughs> for a while, but I'd, I'd like to now open it up to the audience for, for some questions that we have. Back up here in the... Yeah, it seems to me that in order for the paradigm to shift, there needs to be education to both the consuming public as well as the consumer, right? Um, and, and this has come in the form of, of education, just in terms of knowledge as well as I'm just going to be bumping this myth and get the reading for a Dennis, the question is, what are you doing in terms of education well, I'm really resistant to evan evangelical stuff. I, I just don't like it myself. So we only, we we don't we don't do anything uh, because we think if you're there, it might be to, you might be on a date and you might have other objectives than hearing us. <laughs> uh, you know, we got to keep the species going um, and. <laughs> And uh, so anyway, you know, that's really how we think about it is that, we, you know, we, we, I just don't think I have the right just because I have a, a credential to go out and tell you what I'm up to. And if you just crack the door and say we're interested in that, we're on you like white on rice and we're showing you everything that we've done and what we've learned. And then we say this ought not be impressive to you, even though it's impressive compared to other, other stuff that's out there. But the more broader education thing, I think it's really profound because changing our minds individually is a lot easier than we think. I think that we run along and we really are consuming beings. We are really, we are really a product of our era. We really give a lot up, I believe, a tr almost all of our volition to the circumstances we were born in. You would, you would be completely different if you were born in the 14th century or in the third or 12 centuries from now. So we don't choose to define ourselves. We choose to just accept how we've been defined by, why, by where and how we were, uh, and w we were born. So I think, you know, to your point about how do you change the paradigm, I just think each of us can change our minds and then just start experimenting with being more lovingly supportive of folks and seeing if there are things that we can do to use less resources, seeing if we can endeavor to be fair to other folk that are on the planet. You know, just just experiment with it, and uh, don't use me as an example. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it, and it's very interesting. I mean, actually, I mean, I don't. I, I I admit I haven't been to proximity. I'm dying to go, um, but uh, they've they've done some very interesting experiments that show that if you say, oh, you know, putting your, you know, millions of gallons of water used and, you know, it's good to do your towels, you know, that has uh, a 50%, you know, action rate. If you say that 75% of the hotel guests uh, in, you know, do this, it actually trends very closely towards 75%. If you say that people in this room on average, and they've done this, pick a number, um, the number, the, the rate in that room trends toward that number. So making it cool, making it the norm, making it sort of, I mean, you know, bringing back shame, if you will, uh, actually is very, very effective. It doesn't have to be negative. It can be, hey, all, everybody else before you has done a great thing, and you can too. And then you feel good. Hey, I'm not Let's, bringing it down. Yeah. But I just oh. want to real quickly say, that, and this, this question got answered at the outside of the onion, the middle of the onion, and the center of the onion. You know, there's all different places where, where you can uh, sort of take it on. 
And we are relatively proactive. There's an education center. We think that you know, we don't have precise, but over 15,000 people have taken tours. There's a lot of, of, of um, I write op-eds about it and that sort of stuff. So there's a lot of, of momentum, and we think we're really doing a lot to help educate people. But once you're there and you're planning to leave money behind, we just don't think we should insert ourselves other than if you open the door. And if you came, you would see. It would be very available to you. Do you treat ones and twenties the same at your hotel? <laughs> okay. I think we're going to get our asses kicked by Mother Nature. We're going to go through absolute hell. Uh, the Dark Ages are going to look like the Renaissance. And then we're going to get our shit together. And we're going to live in harmony with the planet. And everything's going to be great. But we're going to have to go through hell to get to heaven. Well, I would, I would like to uh, yeah, But that's my personal opinion. Um, take that on a little and bit. And I don't get many invited to many parties. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> well, the ship's going down. What the hell? Well, let's party. Um, the, uh, uh, I, I think that what is, is, and capitalism is a really big is. So, you know, what I believe is that we ought not worry about capitalism. We ought to worry about those of us that manipulate capitalists. Capitalists are easily manipulated. They only respond, I mentioned this earlier, to four and a half things. Their shareholders, their customers, their employees, the law, and their conscience. That's the half. <laughs> and they don't, have, they don't get paid to, to respond to their conscience. So if we, you represent, uh, you, in, in, in all of our lives, you can manipulate some or all of those fours and different dimensions of uh, four and a half things in your life because you're friends with capitalists, you, you employ capitalists when you invest in a mutual fund. You, you're always responding to capitalists when you buy something, and you're all staff members somewhere. So if you want to be proactive, you have the ability to change the trajectory by being proactive. My personal thing is a little Quaker. I think like to do it sort of in a peace, love, dove sort of way, and every once in a while I'll you know, get, get feisty. But I'm not the guy that's probably going to jump on the boat and run it into the side of another boat. Even though I think they're doing the right thing, it just ain't, it doesn't seem like that's why I'm here. Um, but uh, my point is, is that you look in the mirror if you want to change capitalist behavior, because the capitalists will respond to us. If they've got to prove that they're using 39% less energy to sell a hotel room, they'll figure out how to do it. But again, we're, we're not capitalists. If you look at the business of the planet, Nothing we do has anything to do with that. That's right. We are as relevant to the business of the planet as monopoly yeah. is to what we consider business. Right. And until we can align the two, uh, you know, again, natural capital is the currency of the planet, chemistry, biology, physics. When that is the sun around which our laws and the way we govern our interactions, then, then we can say we have a clue. Until then, we're just, we're just watching shadows on the wall. And I love this because I answered this uh, relatively on the outside of the onion, saying what is, is, is capitalism is here, and that's true. But capitalism as a concept could disappear if you go more philosophically. Well, it doesn't have to disappear. I mean, it just has to have a different level. core. That's so, all. There, you know, it, you just got to think ab about uh, a lot of these on those sorts of levels. But, yeah, go ahead. Question here. I'm from India.
change completely comes from England, which I think we don't have it. So it is fundamentally, as you say, and I, I studied in England, which has a different system. I lived in France. I came in here, big house, big car. I was doing all Any questions from over on the side? We've got time for one more question. I'd like to find out from the capitalist point of view, yes, it's great that the proximity hotel uses 39% less energy, but on the upfront cost, uh, including everything, how much more did it cost to build that building? And it's uh, platinum winning association. Yeah, I couldn't believe this part of it. We, we spent about $3 million more on a $30 million project. And we spent about two million two hundred thousand dollars less uh, on first cost. If you do an integrated design and you need, uh, we ended up that we needed a third less air conditioning demand. And in the South, about a third of the building's energy uh, is for air conditioning. So we we were able to buy a third smaller air conditioning component. So we saved over uh, one hundred eighty thousand dollars in just the size of the HVAC equipment. We were saving money left and right. Green is green. It's unbelievable. So we'll have our incremental investment back, which is about $800,000 in less than four years. Ha! Unbelievable. Yeah. And, and again, you know, it's, a, it's like cost more compared to what? I mean, every building is a unique engineered object. So there, there is no everything being equal. Everything is different. So again, depending upon your choices, I mean, you know, you can find a range of costs uh, within luxury hotels that range from 100 bucks a square foot to 400 bucks a square foot. So you tell me, more compared to what? It's just, it's not a valid thought process, uh, in, and, in my opinion. And this I mean, is really you know. where the caveat veritas empty report comes in because I think that you could have spent six million dollars more and got no good outcomes and no return. I mean, there's all kinds of, you, you, it, being, just showing up and saying we want a green building and, and, and calling some architect and saying we want it green and then just going off on your boat or something, you're going to get, you got to stay there. I mean, the, you, you, we have a responsibility. The owner side of these businesses are, have been uh, uh, absent. You know, we've been relying too yeah. much on the design uh, side of the business, and we ought, to, as capitalists, we ought to show up and be more involved in these sorts of things. And and uh, and uh, I can promise you that if we weren't so damn paranoid, that we would have probably had all kinds of green things that we regretted because I, I think that seven out of ten green initiatives that were presented to us were bad ideas.